the Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize. It's an announcement anticipated each year by millions around the world. It's easy to see why. The names of previous Nobel Peace Prize recipients include the likes of Malala Yousafzai, President Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela and the 14th Dalai Lama. This year, 351 candidates were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, according to the Nobel Committee, the second highest number ever. And this time, all bets are on figures such as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, or Uyghur scholar Ilhan Toti, also serving a prison sentence in China. But Henrik Erdal, director of the Peace Research Institute Oslo, sees it differently. As is an annual tradition at PRIO, he has published his shortlist of who should get the prize with a focus on human rights defenders and activists. Although PRIO is not part of the Nobel Committee and does not officially nominate laureates, its shortlist is independent, research-based and widely respected. Henrik joins me today alongside David Beasley, former executive director of the United Nations World Food Programme, who accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on its behalf in 2020. I am Arno Siad, and you're listening to Prio's Peace in a Pod. Henrik, David, welcome both. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Henrik, This is your seventh shortlist for the Nobel Peace Prize since taking up the position of director of PRIO. So before we get into it, and maybe so that our listeners know what to expect, let me start with a cheeky question. What's your track record? Have you successfully predicted winners before? Thanks a lot, uh, Arno. And and I'm going to preface my answer by saying that our game is not really to be right and to predict a winner. Our game is to try to say something about what the meaningful and important prizes are, what kind of topics that uh, we would like to see the Nobel Peace Prize Committee award, and uh, also what the potentially good candidates, the good representatives for these uh, these prize domains could be. And then actually, if you look back at the, uh, at the six lists that I've uh, done in the past, the topic of the prize has been on my list uh, for five out of the six years. Last year, we pointed to Ukraine, not not necessarily the same, or we didn't pick the exact right winners, but we had the topic on top of our list. Same with uh, reporters uh, in uh, journalists in in 2021. Uh, We pointed to Reporters Without Borders, uh, but there were two individual reporters, uh, Maria Ressa and Muratov, who got the prize. And then on a couple of occasions, both in 2019 and 2018, we had the winners, uh, the the exact correct winners on our list, uh, 2019 with Abiy Ahmed and 2018 with Dennis McQuay again, Nadia Murad. You were referring to Abi Ahmed Ali, the Ethiopian prime minister who was awarded the prize for his efforts to normalize relations with neighboring Eritrea, and Dennis Mukwege and Nadia Murad, who were awarded the prize jointly in 2018 for their efforts to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. And I believe there is one winner you did not expect, which is today's guest, uh, the World Food Programme via uh, David Beasley. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, exactly. We we were actually ahead of the curve, ahead of the Nobel Committee, because we pointed to World Food Programme several times and and we actually had it uh, on top of our list in 2018. But I have to admit, uh, we we missed it in 2020 when the World Food Bank got the prize. And I was very happy to see that uh, they were the winners that year, but we missed it. And... Henrik, at the top of your shortlist this year are two women, Narges Mohammadi and Mabuba Siraj. Narges Mohammadi is an Iranian human rights activist currently held in prison in Iran. Mabuba Siraj is an Afghan journalist and women's rights activist. Why these two? So these are two representatives of a new and important focus on gender inequality globally, uh, fighting for very basic human rights for women. Uh, This is the 75th anniversary of human rights uh, treaties and focusing on such a fundamental issue as gender inequality of women's right to education, women's right to decide uh, what to wear and and, uh, what to do uh, is absolutely fundamental. Uh, If we look at the importance of long-term of the Peace Prize 
things because human rights, we know that basic human rights is associated with long-term peace and stability. And these are individuals, these are women who work in their home countries, in Iran and in Afghanistan, two countries that are among the most repressive when it comes to women's rights. And put their life and health on the line for their sisters uh, inside uh, these countries. And, and I think that would be an important message to send uh, to the world and, uh, and certainly to these two regimes that uh, women's rights is absolutely fundamental. Hmm. David, what do you make of Henrik's top spot? And who would that be for you this year? Care to make a prediction? This is way above my pay grade, but I will say <laughs> I always trust and respect uh, Henrik's predictions and uh, the people or the organization he comes up with. He, he thinks it through, analyzes it out, and uh, always respectful. So uh, no matter who he chooses, I'm always like, we need to salute that person or that organization. So let me leave it at that. And Henrik, moving on to the second spot on your shortlist, Victoria Tauli Corpus. She's a former UN special reporter on the rights of indigenous peoples, and Juan Carlos Hintiach, he represents the indigenous peoples of Latin America and various international organizations. Can you tell us a bit more about them and why they made it so high on your list? Sure. Uh, Tali Corpus is uh, born in the Philippines. Sintiak is from Ecuador. Uh, they both worked, as you say, internationally for uh, indigenous peoples' rights for a number of years uh, with international organizations. Uh, Tali Corpus has worked uh, for tropical forest conservation. Uh, she's worked against destructive uh, developing projects, climate change, uh, social rights. Hintiak has uh, worked also extensively with indigenous rights in, in uh, the context of uh, nature conservation. He was a uh, democratically elected leader of uh, COICA, the, uh, the Federation for Indigenous Peoples Groups in the Amazon Basin, uh, and has worked extensively with climate change in the um, UN uh, Framework Convention for Climate Change. So these are both individuals who work fundamentally for indigenous peoples' rights, but also um, more broadly in the context of, uh, of environment and climate change and connecting, in a way, this large, important global topic of environmental conservation and, and uh, fight against climate change to uh, the important cause of indigenous populations. And that would be a, a prize that also resonates well, I think, in, in Norway with, with recent discussions about rights of the indigenous populations in Norway. You're referring, of course, to the discussions in Norway around the Sami and the Kvens. David, you headed the World Food Programme from 2017 until you stepped down earlier this year. In December 2020, you accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the WFP for its efforts to combat world hunger. Take us back to that moment the winner, your organization, was announced. Where were you and did you expect it? Well, what a day. That's not a phone call you get often. <laughs> you know? And so what was really interesting, uh, maybe because of Henry's short list, uh, but there was a lot of speculations a couple years before that we might receive it. In fact, I was given a speech, I think it was in 2019 or 18, I can't remember, but uh, to the Austrian parliament members, and we thought that we might get it. And so I was in the middle of the speech, and I had my team member on the side holding the phone just in case. So I was really distracted thinking we might get the phone call, you know, and we didn't get the phone call. <laughs> so I told my team, never, ever bring this up to me again. Don't bring it up. I said, stay focused on what we do. And if it happens, then, then great, wonderful. It happens naturally. And so we just stayed focused. And what was really interesting is the day that it was it was to be announced. I was in uh, Niger, in the middle of a horrible situation where we had Al Qaeda to the north of us, ISIS to the south of us, and and uh, that morning it was about five thirty or six in the morning. I was getting a quick breakfast, and I think it was the Norwegian ambassador. Uh, at a breakfast table, said, "Ma, ah, Mr. Beasley, you think y'all make it the Nobel Peace Prize today?" And I, then I realized it was that it was today. And I said, "Oh, please don't bring this up to me. Look, we're just focused on what we do." And we laughed, and I moved on. And so I was out in the middle of the countryside negotiating between uh, this extreme situation with the with the military of Niger. And I had I was sitting at a table in an office, 
in as we had come back in uh, from the countryside and just pounding the table about we've got to have access, we've got to have access. If we can't reach these people, then ISIS and Al-Qaeda will, by, by denying food, they'll recruit using food. And so about that time, somebody bust into the office and I looked up like, what are you doing busting in this office? I didn't say that, I was thinking that. And this person said, Nobel Peace Prize. And I was like, oh yeah, right, yeah, who won it? The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 2020 to the World Food Program for its efforts. He said, you did, the World Food Program did. <laughs> so, it, was, it was quite a day and quite a surprise. In fact, in, I don't know if I've, I've told, uh, Henrik, I don't know if I told you this, but you know, the first person you want to call is your wife, you know, your closest person to you on the planet. And that particular night, she had, she had flown back to the United States and it was like, I don't know, three in the morning. Well, you know, when you're a parent and you get a phone call at three in the morning, it's not good. It's either somebody's died or, or one of your children are in jail, that kind of thing. And so little did I know she had a dream the night before. My wife doesn't have these kind of dreams, so this really makes it sort of spectacular. She had a dream that I was killed in Niger. So she gets this phone call from me uh, at three in the morning for her, early in the morning in Niger. And so I go to say, you know, Nobel Peace Prize, but I can't speak. I'm so choked up because of the emotions. Well, all she hears is her husband's choked up on the phone knowing that she had this dream. So you can imagine the trauma going on in my life. And after about 10 seconds of silence, I finally was able to get the words out, Nobel Peace Prize. And so anyway, what a, an incredible magical moment that day was when we were so, so honored by uh, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. It's an incredible story. And, and, it seems like the surprise didn't really end after winning it, right? Because you've seen firsthand what winning the Nobel Peace Prize can do to an organization. You've said it was instrumental in opening doors and massively increasing funding for the WFP. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. In fact, in, in my opinion, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, committee was way ahead of, of everybody. I think they were sending two messages uh, to the world. One was, thank you, World Food Program, for the incredible efforts, all your women and men who lay their lives on the line every day to bring peace and food security to the world. Thank you for what you've done. But it was also a clarion call, a wake-up call to the rest of the world is, it's bad right now, but it's going to get worse, and we really must help the poorest of the poor. And the World Food Program is the world's largest humanitarian operation, impacting the most people on the planet. Let's give them the support they need to save lives and bring peace in nations, because when you don't have food security, you don't have peace. And so, in fact, because of uh, this extraordinary recognition, it allowed my voice to go up a thousandfold to wake up leaders around the world to the reality that they were facing. Because as you well know, every leader is a victim of the propaganda and the information they can that gets in their hands or they hear. In today's world, there's so much information out there and disinformation. How do you break through that noise? to let the leaders and help the leaders understand how serious this situation really, really is or really, really was at that time. And so this recognition helped us break through all of that noise and our funding and our support went up. And in my opinion, it really helps not just save millions upon millions of lives around the world, but it also helped stabilize nations around the world and averted mass migration in many nations around the world. And it's quite extraordinary to hear you talk so fondly of the WFP, uh, given the fact that you were initially skeptical when offered the role by the Trump administration. Uh, you are a conservative member of the Republican Party, 
And you were rather dubious, like some of your conservative peers, about international organization and what they can do. You even hoped to put the WFP out of business to eliminate the need for it. And to now being one of its most fervent advocates, I'd like to ask you about that intellectual journey. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, that really was quite a journey. In fact, when I got a phone call from a friend who was a, a senior person in the United Nations, what I consider taking a role in the Trump administration. And I said, look, George Bush was one of my best friends when I was United States governor. I didn't take a role then and don't plan to take a role now. And this person said, well, we're very, you know, very concerned about uh, the United Nations and Trump. And I said, well, <laughs> you should be. And uh, he said, would you take a role in the United Nations? I said, no, I'm not looking for a job. And I said, what do you, what do you, what are you getting to? And, uh, he said, well, the World Food, he talked about a couple organizations, but he said the World Food Program is the most extraordinary organization. I said, I really don't know a lot about it. Uh, I had a friend uh, that was on uh, the executive board as a U.S. ambassador to the World Food Program, a Democrat from Ohio named Tony Hall. And uh, so I called Tony. I said, Tony, tell me about the World Food Program. And Tony said, oh, my God, if there's God's work on earth, it's the World Food Program. I said, Tony, the United Nations World Food Program, we both laughed. You know, He said, no, it's an amazing organization. And um, I talked to a few Democrat and Republican senators uh, who were who critical on, as you know, on strategic international foreign aid. And I said, guys, I'm not looking for a job. They said, you've got to take this role. You're the only one that can uh, reverse uh, Trump's thinking on cutting international aid. And I said, well, let me do that. I just don't need the job. Well, anyway, you know, six years later, I, 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 <laughs> and with a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so they talked me into it, and it really wasn't that difficult uh, shifting the mindsets at the White House because the World Food Program's aid is so strategic, and there were so many Democrat and Republican senators that were very, very... Uh, knowledgeable about the effectiveness of the World Food Program. So I take this role, uh, uh, you know, kind of kicking and screaming, but, you know, when you make a decision, you go do something, you go do it and give it the, the best you can. And what I learned quickly was, the, was that the World Food Program was an extraordinary organization. Yes, the world's largest humanitarian operation. But when I took it, we were facing four famines around the world, major financial cuts, and I knew there was a lot of uphill fights. But I also thought from a positive perspective that, you know, the world's population at that time was about 7.6, 7.7 billion. And we had been reducing poverty and hunger all around the world. And we were now down to 80 million people in extreme hunger. So I'm thinking, wow, you know, former United States governor, we set goals, we set objectives, we set benchmarks, we can achieve zero hunger. We can, we can do this. I can put the World Food Program out of business because we're going to be able to food secure the nations that are fragile and vulnerable. Well, it went backwards because of war and conflict and climate shocks. And then, of course, COVID. And then the Ethiopian war, Ukraine, Afghanistan. Ukraine, of course, the breadbasket of the world. And so that's the journey. And now we're 350 million people marching towards starvation. That's, that's a different number than chronic hunger, which is over... Uh, 800 million people, but the 350 million are those that don't know where their next meal is coming from, and they are not just facing starvation, but these are the people that will result in mass migration and destabilization of nations. And so I try to explain to leaders, whether you're from the left or the right, it's a lot cheaper, and it's the right and moral thing to do, and go in and help them where they are at home versus allowing them to die, to be destabilized and create chaos around the world. Right, and, and what you're saying is a reminder of how essential the work of so many of these international organizations are. And in fact, Henrik, I'd like to ask you about two organizations that have made it to your shortlist this year, the International Court of Justice, or ICJ, and the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. I was a bit surprised by the shortlisting of the ICJ. Ukraine has two ongoing cases against the Russian Federation before the court relating to the war. The ICJ is a UN body and the UN has been powerless so far in putting an end to that war. So can you tell us why you picked these two organizations? And are you hoping perhaps that the ICJ winning the Nobel Peace Prize could have a similar effect to that the WFP experienced? 
Absolutely. The, the um, a price to the ICJ would be something that uh, would boost their position. And as, uh, as David says, the uh, one of the major challenges in, in recent years has been that many of these places where states come together to solve problems have been uh, weakened. And uh, just like the World Food Programme, the ICJ has a very important role uh, in being an arena for states to come together to solve major problems. ICJ was um, established Back in 1945, all UN members are also members of the court. Uh, this is a multilateral mechanism, the main mechanism for solving disputes between states peacefully. So uh, it is an important body. It doesn't really have, you know, a, a large stick, uh, a, an enforcement mechanism that uh, that makes them sort of operate in isolation from all other UN bodies. And of course, in cases like Ukraine, where the UN Security Council is tied uh, because uh, one of the v- to powers is uh, is uh, waging a war in Ukraine. Uh, it does mean that uh, that there is only so much the UN can do. But the ICJ has an important role in in uh, both this conflict and, and other conflicts in settling uh, you know the the the, uh, the scores. And and the ICJ was early in putting out a ruling saying that Russia should uh, suspend all this uh, its uh, war activities in Ukraine. Uh, it's also engaged in a lot of other uh, conflicts around the world. And and so the ICJ would uh, remind us that we have a primary conflict resolution mechanism in an international court. The um, Human Rights Data Analysis Group is a very different type of organization. It's not a UN organization, it's an NGO. Uh, It's uh, doing work to document war crimes and uh, and human rights abuses, and they collect data internationally. uh, And they contribute these to courts, international courts like the ICJ, but uh, but also to governments for truth and reconciliation commissions. And so uh, this would be a prize that is emphasizing the role of research, the role of systematic data collection, and the way that this can bring out the truth, bring out the the facts on the ground and be the basis both for legal action and for reconciliation efforts. And Henrik, your list also includes Burmese ambassador Chao Motun, who stunned the world in February 2021 with an appeal at the United Nations to stop the military coup in Myanmar. We, the committee representing Chirongsu Soto, CRPH, duly asked the United Nations the United Nations Security Council and international community that aspire to build peaceful and civilized global society to use any means necessary to take action against the Myanmar military. And he ended his speech with a three-fingered salute used by protesters. Since then, he has represented the people of Myanmar in the UN on behalf of the National Unity Government. In fact, your shortlist also includes uh, the National Unity Government. So can you talk to us a bit about that? The National Unity Government is fighting the uh, brutal military uh, dictatorship that is now ruling uh, Myanmar. It's representing different ethnic uh, religious groups, uh, different regional groups. uh, And together with Ambassador Thun, they've been the most significant, important uh, sources fighting for the restoration of democracy and peace uh, in Myanmar. So a prize to uh, Ambassador Thun and to the um, National Unity Government would be a reminder of the importance of uh, pro-democracy human rights engagement uh, against military dictatorship, which uh, is is something that we've seen a return of, unfortunately, not only in that region, but uh, but across the world. Uh, and, And one thing that I think the Nobel Committee should be looking at. Right. And your list is essentially made of human rights defenders and activists, but no political leader. Last year, there was a lot of buzz around Ukrainian President Zelensky potentially winning the Nobel Peace Prize. He's still a favorite of bookmakers this year. The name of NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has also been floating around as a potential winner. And other favorites include jailed opposition leader Alexei Navalny in Russia, Uyghur economist Ilham Toti, sentenced to life imprisonment in China, and Belarusian politician and activist in exile Svetlana Tsinatuskaya. Henrik, who didn't you include on your shortlist and why? So there are always a number of great candidates that uh, that don't make it to our list. And, and we are trying to point to different themes to different candidates because I think it's important to underscore that there are so many important, great contributions to peace that are often not recognized. And, and the Nobel Peace Prize is uh, one important way of recognizing those kind of achievements. But there are not... 
uh, not all of the worthy candidates that, uh, that of course, make it uh, to that uh, final decision by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. I think when it comes to state leaders, there's always a risk in, uh, involved in, in giving the prize to a state leader. And Abiy Ahmed is, of course, a, a case in point there. I think when it comes to Zelensky and, and Stoltenberg, uh, which, as you notice, uh, are both high on the, on the bookmaker lists, um, Ukraine is fighting a just war against Russian aggression and, and Russian invasion, but it will be difficult, I think, for the Nobel Committee to award the peace prize to a president at war and those who are supplying the arms for that war, even if the war is uh, legitimate and, and just. Then I also think that there is, um, we've had now two prizes that have been pointing at Ukraine and, and also the year before at, uh, at Russia with, uh, with Muratov uh, being one of the prize winners. You're referring to to Dmitry Muratov, the Russian journalist and editor-in-chief of Novaya Gazeta, who has since been declared by the Russian authorities as a foreign agent. I think it's important for the committee to point to other contributions elsewhere in the world. Uh, there is a danger that we in Europe uh, focus on Ukraine to the uh, expense of, uh, of other conflict areas and other worthy causes. And I think the committee is very aware of that. There are so many important contributions to peace that that are happening all around the world. And uh, it's important that they are also pointing to, to some uh, to, to non-European contributions to peace. And, and I think the committee will likely do that this year. David, last question is for you. According to WFP figures, today across the globe, nearly 800 million people do not have enough food. And 350 million people are marching towards starvation, as you said earlier. There is a lot winning a Nobel Peace Prize can do, as you talked about. But world events, whether COVID or the war in Ukraine, are sometimes lessons in humility in the face of reality. So with that said, and to end on an optimistic note... What do you hope this year's Nobel Peace Prize can achieve? Well, you know, no one does what they do to receive an award. They do it because it's the good, the right thing to do. And so when you look at all like what Henrik's list, these are just amazing people out there that need to be applauded and encouraged and they be role models for others to stand up and do what's right. But the Nobel Peace Prize itself, does give such notorious attention to those men and women and organizations out there that hopeful, hopefully that will continue to inspire and encourage others to step forward, do us right, so that we can bring peace to a very, very divisive and fragile world at this time. So I'm hoping and thinking that there's no better time in world history than the Nobel Peace Prize to be speaking out as it does at a time like this. David, Henrik, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The 2023 Nobel Peace Prize is announced on October 6th and the ceremony will take place in Oslo on December 10th. This episode was produced by Arno Siad and edited by Brage Pedersen with sounds from Nobel Prize and the United Nations. <laughs>